Good morning, everyone. We are at the start of another week together, and I'm glad that you've chosen to start your day with some better news. Just a quick announcement for you before we get started. Due to some changes in my schedule and my workload, Better News Daily will now be every weekday, Monday through Thursday, not Friday. So we will have these devotionals four days a week, and then we'll have a little bit of a longer break over the weekend until the following Monday. So sorry about that, but that will be our schedule going forward. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into what we're talking about for today. Today, we are going to look at a book of the Bible that's a lot of fun. So maybe to set the scene, if you were to just read your Bible front to back, having never read it before, you would be in for a number of weird surprises along the way. (laughs) You'd read Genesis and think, oh, this is interesting. I like this. Uh, Exodus, you'd still be fine. Uh, then, then you'd get to Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and if you make it through those on a first reading, you deserve a medal. Then you get to the, the books of history, which have a lot of interesting stories in them, and you'd get to Psalms, which has a lot of beautiful poetry, you like that, and Proverbs has a lot of nuggets of wisdom in there for you to chew on. <laughs> then you'd read Ecclesiastes and then take an antidepressant. But then you would get to the Song of Songs. Now, you at first would be like, well, this this sounds nice. The last book was really depressing. Now for a song. Great. You'd start reading, and then, oh my. You'd soon find that this book is like no other in the Bible. If you don't know, the Song of Songs is a book of love poetry between a king and a maiden. They serenade each other with vows of love, and they praise each other's physical beauty. Uh, She will sing, then he will sing, and then some friends will join in every so often. Weird. Uh, I remember first coming across this book as a kid, and my sister and I thought it was hilarious. We would pass long car trips by trying to find the funniest verse in this book and then making the other person read it out loud. (laughs) Your teeth are white as sheep, recently shorn and freshly washed. Your waist is like a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. (laughs) Now in fifth grade, this book is hysterical. But in sixth grade, something weird happens, and this book is no longer funny. It's just wildly uncomfortable. And you think, this is in our Bibles? In our pews? (laughs) And the question always comes up, what do we do with this book? And two general extremes tend to form in Christianity. On one hand, you have people who say, this is all just an allegory about God and his people or about Jesus and the church. So you know that kid's song, he invites me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. Those words are a verse from Song of Songs. But in the context of this, they are the words of the woman about her lover. But if you interpret it allegorically, well, it's about God. The other extreme would say, no, this is all just ancient Near Eastern love poetry between a man and a woman. That's it. I mean, God isn't even really mentioned at all in this book. There's kind of a a half mention of him in chapter 8. But even if you count that one, that's it. This is just passionate love poems. That's all. I don't think either of these approaches is totally fair to this book, though. Is it an allegory? It could be. It does capture some of the passion with which God pursues his people, but it clearly isn't meant to be just that. It's human love poetry, too, and that doesn't make this a bad or completely secular work. (laughs) We'll get to that. 
though. So I was, I was tempted today to just zoom in on a couple key passages that are really helpful to men and women and romantic relationships because this book has a lot to offer and to think about in that realm. Uh, but because this is a short form video and because this series is not built to give relationship advice, I decided that the thought for today would be more general. And I think this will be helpful because it's good to think about this book as a whole before you just zoom in on different passages of it. So let me start by just reading the way that this book begins with you in chapter one, just to give you a sense of what this book is like. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. <laughs> okay, I'm stopping already. We didn't get far. Uh, sometimes this book is called the Song of Solomon, but the Song of Songs is its title. And this is just a Hebrew idiom, which means the song to top all other songs. It's not just a song, it's the song. So think of like King of Kings or Lord of Lords or Holy of Holies. Same idea. So this amazing song is attributed to Solomon in some way. It's debated whether Solomon is the actual author or if it's someone else who's attributing this to the wisdom tradition of Solomon. But okay, this is the song to beat all other songs. Now let's listen to the lyrics. The, the book begins with the woman character speaking. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. And then it goes on from there. You get the idea. Sometimes you will giggle at the metaphorical descriptions that are given. Sometimes you will blush. Sometimes you will swoon. It's love poetry. And it's really well-constructed poetry at that. But okay. Here's my question for you. Why is love poetry in the Bible? This is the question of Song of Songs, I think. To many, this book feels really inessential in the overall story of God and humanity. And I think this is why people want to turn this primarily into an allegory about God and his people. But I think that you'll run into some problems if you lean too heavily on that interpretation. This book is primarily a celebration of romantic love. So what am I supposed to draw from this kind of love poetry? Now I'm going to do something that I don't usually do for these videos. I'm going to answer my own question. <laughs> now I would encourage you to pause this video and answer the question for yourself before hearing my answer. But I think that this is an important thing to understand, so I do want to share. So, okay, pause the video and answer this question, and then keep watching. All right, so why is love poetry in the Bible? Why is the Song of Songs, the song to beat all other songs, a romantic love poem? There's something about the covenant love between this man and woman that points to something deeper. Lying inside every person is a desire to be in relationship with others, to, to be known and loved. And because sin has entered this world, to be in relationship is a risk. You can get wounded. But that doesn't mean that love is foolish. We all know that a loving relationship with someone else is deeply rewarding and fulfilling. That's because God made us to experience and enjoy this. Now that relationship might be deeply emotional with a friend or a family member. It might be spiritual with another believer, or it might also be romantic and physical. And through the Song of Songs, the Bible is inviting us into a worldview where this romantic, physical kind of love and attraction can be just as good and fulfilling. See, in a secular culture where love and sexuality are commoditized and exploited, and in a modern Christian culture 
that can be so touchy about this subject that these things can feel taboo and dirty, the Song of Songs is a positive biblical picture of the desires and passions that God has planted in us. These desires can be good and exciting in the right context. And plus, the love between these two characters is not merely physical, right? I mean, it is that, but it's also self-sacrificial and emotional. So why is love poetry in the Bible? Why am I reading about human romance and a story about God? Because romance is part of the human experience of love that God wired us for. And in a sinful world where relationships and sexuality often leave scars, this is a beautiful picture of what God has in mind. This book holds out hope that this kind of love has goodness that can still be reclaimed and enjoyed. Now that might not be the message that you need right now in your stage of life, and that's okay. But I know that for some of you, this is very important for you to hear. That's my thought for you to think about. Time for us to pick which book we'll go to tomorrow. Oh, officially, drum roll please, we have made it halfway through the books of the Bible. Woohoo! This was the 33rd book of the Bible that we talked about today. And I didn't think that it would happen, but it's looking like we will make it through every book of the Bible before we've gotten back to a weekly church gathering. Whoa. <laughs> but I'm having fun with this project, so I don't mind doing it still. The book we're going to tomorrow will take you 13 seconds to read. It's Second John. <laughs> so hey, if you want to read it ahead of time and come prepared, you're welcome to do that. All right, I'll see you tomorrow on Tuesday. Until then, have a wonderful rest of your day. See ya.